Uh, Jennifer Schenker, Editor-in-Chief of The Innovator, um, a magazine about digital transformation. And I'm very pleased uh, to um, be moderating uh, the panel this morning on increasing resilience uh, in energy systems. Um, we have uh, a great panel. Uh, immediately to my right, we have uh, Jeff um, Radebe, uh, who is the Minister um, of Energy uh, from South Africa. Uh, we have Sun Zhansheng, uh, who is uh, from the International Energy Forum. Uh, Anna Tribovich, who is the CEO, COO of Singularity Grid in, uh, in uh, Germany. Uh, and Carlo Papa from NL Foundation, and um, Ch Chun Young Gu, uh, who is President Asia, uh, Middle East, and Africa for ABB. Um, so this morning, we're going to talk about um, the kind of pressures that uh, traditional players are under uh, from uh, <coughs> Three trends, uh, electrification, uh, decentralization, and di digitalization. Um, at the same time, they are also facing challenges in helping to meet the, uh, the goals of the Paris Agreement uh, on climate change, um, and uh, issues around um, cyber, uh, cyber attacks and, and associated uh, vulnerabilities. So against this backdrop, we're going to talk about um, how can business and government work together to create uh, more resilient uh, energy systems from a, from a global perspective. Um, so Carla, let me, let me kick off with you, because um, some of the same um, developments that may be seen on the surface as adding vulnerability to the system can actually make them more resilient. So let's, let's talk about how adding uh, dis distributed systems to, uh, to the energy grid um, is working out in reality. Yeah, thank you very much. It's typically, I mean, people are talking about distributed generation or electric vehicles as a constraint for the network or a problem. Uh, a troublemakers uh, uh, for the network. It really depends on which technologies you are looking at. If you look at the technology is implemented today in a certain number of countries, those two elements particularly can be actually supporting the managing of the network because the distributed generation is able today even to provide ancillary services. If you are talking about wind park or solar park in big system, they are able today to provide what a gas-fired power plant would have been able to provide 10 years ago. So the distributed generation is uh, up to the level, not only in terms of cost, you know, people are talking about the cost of solar and wind that has become a reality and uh, competitive, but also in supporting the system rather than uh, making trouble in the system. There's another factor that, as you all know, the, the uh, renewable systems are distributed and are of a small size compared to nuclear or coal or other power plant. And this uh, automatically embed more resilience to the system because, let's say, if a typhoon that we just uh, seen uh, in our, let's say, in the neighboring country of Philippines, Hong Kong, it's a certain part of the country, it will affect only a portion of the assets that are, uh, that are there, and there will be other assets able to produce electricity for the entire system. On the other side, if you're looking at electric vehicles, and you look at vehicle-to-grid technology, that again is not something that will come in the future, it's something that has been, uh, is being used today, actually each and every single battery of, uh, that you have in cars or even in train or even in, or more in buses can be a, a way to stabilize the network. Thinking about, think about the bus that goes uh, in the garage at night and uh, can constitute a big bulk of uh, battery that can support the system. Imagine during heat waves period where high condition are peaking uh, you know, the system, that batteries can actually use today for balancing the system. So, Chun Young, um, I know ABV is very involved with um, e-mobility, e uh, electric cars, and so forth, and, and also <coughs> in infrastructure. So do you think that today's infrastructure is up to the job, or does it need uh, an overhaul? Thank you very much. Today, the utility is really facing a 
challenge, but that was a very interesting period because if you look at the, the supply side, like you mentioned, uh, it's more and more renewables are, are integrated, which renewables are depending on the weather. And then from the demand side, we talk about mobility. So, so really, it's, the pattern has been changed. They are used to be very predictable, very planable, very controllable. In the past, you know, the load is very defined for the household in the morning is the peak, evening is the peak, industry has the base load. This is completely changed. And then on top of that, there's a lot to talk about the connectivity between the countries. Because uh, again, it's because of renewables. So some country has a very rich with hydro resource. They want to connect with the renew renewables to balance, like use energy storage. Some even has this idea to connect between the east and the west to follow the sun. Have a sun sunrise, sunset. You can continue to have the solar power. So all this connectivity creates a lot, a lot of, of course, the opportunity, but also challenges. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the. I think the most worry is organization readiness is not there, at least not everywhere. Okay, we should not say not there, but if you put the general statement for utility, the organizational readiness is not there because of the transition, because of the culture. And that is, of course, the time scale they used to work is like the days, or maybe even you know, weeks. And now we are talking about the seconds, the minutes, things that could happen, how to react, etc. And that creates a lot of challenges for the utilities. And also there's a cultural piece we see. Uh, actually, a lot of things have happened. It's not every day, but a lot of things happen. And people don't want to talk about it, don't want to sh uh, share about it. Uh, for the reason, because maybe they want to show this as a weakness. Sometimes they have a feeling it's a failure. And that I hope it will, because if you don't share, you don't learn, and it will be very difficult for, for, for the industry to be prepared. Hmm. Okay, so that's yeah. where I think uh, we can we can look at your international organization um, and what role do you see um, the International Energy Forum um, playing in and helping to sort out some of these issues. Okay, thank you, uh, Sankar. Uh, I think it's a uh, very good subject because uh, for the uh, uh, energy industry is the high investment, uh, high risk, and also high uh, uh, the recovery of this the uh, business. So by this one, I think the government and also the business, the corporation is very important because the government have to have a understanding and open a, a favorable policy and the, uh, the, uh, the investment environment, and then the business can evolve. And the, especially for the uh, oil and gas, because the big investment and the high risk. So for this part, I think the business really like to uh, have a safe environment to, the, uh, to invest and that they can get the money back. So I think the both sides need the, uh, the, uh, the insurance. And the, so I think the dialogue is very important. So Minister, please tell us how, you know, how this discussion is playing out in South Africa. And also maybe you can address whether um, you see an opportunity for South Africa to kind of leapfrog some of the older technology that's being used in the West and go right to some, some of the newer technologies like, like blockchain. Yeah, as you may be aware, in South Africa, our energy is generated uh, through coal, which is very dominant, and also a state-owned company utility, which has been dominating for the past 100 or so years. But recently, because of our Paris Agreement and other international uh, obligations that we have in terms of climate change, we are increasingly moving, moving towards uh, renewable energy. So we felt that... Uh, this is be an opportunity to bring in the private sector into the generation market in our country to create a competition mm -hmm. with the utility, which has gone very well as we speak in South Africa today. So therefore, we really appreciate the involvement of the private sector that has, that has invested almost over 200 billion rands in the South African economy through this renewable energy. And moving forward, in terms of our national development plan, our vision 2030, we need to ensure that by 2030, we've got more than 20,000 megawatts of electricity out of renewables. Right now, we are around 6,300 megawatts. We are completing, as we speak in South Africa, our integrated resource plan. And this resource plan indicates that uh, uh, our least cost plan must be renewables wind, solar, as well as uh, gas. Mm -hmm. 
So that's the direction that we are moving. That's why we're very keen to understand how we can be able to take advantage of these technologies that are there so that we can be able to mitigate some job losses that can be affected through our transition from coal towards a renewable energy. Thank you. So I think that's a perfect transition to you, Anna. So let's talk about um, the role blockchain is playing in the sector. We're hearing a lot of noise from new entrants like Power Ledger, um, another one called Switch, that are building uh, what they say are going to be global exchanges of energy that they say once their system is up and running, there will be no need for traditional um, energy providers, that the cost of energy will go to zero, um, and it's all going to be peer-to-peer -peer and you're going to trade around the world. But the same technology, blockchain, can also be used to the advantage of traditional players. And I'd like to hear um, from you about how your um, Energy Web Foundation um, is, um, is using blockchain to bring together some of the traditional players with startups. Yes, um, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, I think the disruption will be interesting, um, but it will not be as radical as, as you know, some may pose it. At the end, it will be a hybrid system and we will still need the grid. Um, and uh, so the, these innovators that you're talking about are very useful in responding to the challenges that um, Mr. Gu has pointed out, which is the complexity of the new connections, the issues with the grid balancing, uh, because blockchain is a technology that has that very potential to aggregate, uh, to settle, uh, in a way to help resolve those challenges, which is why so many innovators are looking at blockchain. Uh, now, utilities at the moment, um, some are innovating. They actually have become IT companies building apps and have dev teams as part of the, the company, uh, but not very many. And in terms of geographic coverage, uh, they, are, they span around the world. Uh, some of our leading, uh, at the moment, innovators are actually Singapore Power, which is close to here, um, but also Angie from France, and, and then there are others who are, who are starting to look at uh, blockchain uh, Shell for sure, and, and, and many others. Um, uh, startups that you mentioned, like Power Ledger and Switch, uh, and there are others, um, work with these uh, utilities. And what we have done um, at the Energy Web Foundation, which is a nonprofit global consortium, is to pull these efforts together. And what is happening is that many of the corporates are actually um, investing in these startups, uh, buying a share or sometimes majority share of the startups to bring in the innovation, uh, but generally working together. In a very competitive uh, market, they're collaborating because in the, the actual the technology is still early stage. So everyone realizes that, that collaboration is necessary uh, to bring it to market sooner. Uh, because uh, more disruptive apps like peer-to-peer -peer trading will probably come last. They require also some legal changes mm -hmm. because the law doesn't recognize your fridge as an energy trader. Um, uh, but um, some of the others that we're working on, like tracking renewable energy, uh, issuing certificates through a blockchain, getting a global app to exchange those, are already happening. So uh, some of the innovation will come to life uh, in the next uh, year, uh, the more disruptive one probably in several years to come. How do you see um, a technology like blockchain um, helping um, a country like South Africa achieve its goals? Yes. Uh, so that South Africa was our first uh, demonstration uh, use case. Uh, I was at MIT with my colleague, co-founder, Ewald Hesse, about two and a half years ago. It was the first blockchain event at the MIT uh, Media Lab. And we connected uh, with a colleague in, in South Africa, Lauren Gamarov. And uh, live there at MIT, we paid directly to a smart meter and lit up a school in Africa. Uh, so it was a donation of one Bitcoin at the time. Uh, it would have lasted many years of electricity today, but it was several months of electricity uh, back two and a half years ago when we paid uh, for that smart meter. And the fact that it happened live, immediately, real time, with only you know, several seconds delay, 
um, is, is, was a visual uh, that demonstrated the potential of this technology. Now, the currency, the way we see it from a blockchain perspective, is the most simple application. It's transferring money from A to B. Now, when you get to other values and other processes that you want to put in a blockchain where you have to program them like any other app, it's a little more complex. It requires more scale. Um, but like I said, some are ready um, in the next few months. Others uh, will come. So the technology has uh, to be explored. We are yet to see if it will fully be reach the potential that it seems to have. So we always have that caveat. But so far, it's uh, moving uh, much more fast than we had expected. So let's, um, let's now move to the issue of security. Um, you know, you, you touched on this a little bit uh, where, when you said people don't like to talk about their weaknesses. But, you know, when, as we're moving to new business models, new technologies, bringing in new players, um, this connectivity um, also brings in some vulnerability. So um, I know ABB is part of a new uh, initiative that the forum is launching on cyber resilience. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, ABB has been a member of this forum, and they, we have the, quite a few discussions. A couple of things was discussed. One thing we would like to see we could share as much uh, as possible the case we have learned. Of course, it's not realistic to ask people to share all the details. Maybe we could define certain kind of standards with the protocols. So whether it's based on the regional-wise acceptable standard or if its next step is global-wide, we can see at least on a certain level we should be able to share. That is one, one topic we have been discussed. Another topic we have been discussed, the challenge we have seen in this is because of the utility, as I mentioned before, uh, you, when you go to this uh, cyber security, this IT investment, it's, this is a, it requires a lot of investment. And this investment, a lot of utilities are state-owned companies, and of course all these investments are decided by the very, yeah, very strong governance from the board and from the governments, etc. The cycle, I should say, relatively takes a long time. Mm -hmm. And so we, it's important that we create a, a awareness at the board of directors as, as a guiding principle, what they should be aware. So that is at least one of the things we have been defined. And we still feel it's a little bit too narrow, but it's the first step. So the board, if you sit in the board of directors in the utility, you need to ask certain questions regarding the cyber securities and they be aware of their responsibility. We would like to even, of course, ideally we would like to go even further, but at least it's a very good step. Minister, how big of a concern is this uh, for you? Because, um, I mean, I think everybody's aware if, you, if, if the grid is attacked, you can bring a country to its knees. Um, and, and this is a concern everywhere in the world. Um, how, how is your government trying to, to deal with this? Um, and, and, and what kind of dialogue do you think is, is an agreements need to be put in place? Well, we have uh, what we call uh, a justice and security cluster in South Africa, which consists of ministers that are responsible for justice and crime prevention. So it is a very big issue where we're investing a lot of money recently in order to ensure that we are in line with what is happening around the world in order to ensure that all those people who are involved in, in cybercrime can be brought to book. But it also means that we need to train a lot of people especially with the advent of the fourth industrial revolution where uh, children who enter primary school this year uh, will be in jobs that do not exist. So it means we need to put even more money into education in order to train our people, especially youngsters. But also, we need to ensure as well that we put more money into research and development. Our goals is that by year 2025, we need to ensure that at least we spend 1.5% uh, of the GDP in terms of uh, R&D. We're still very far behind there at about 0 0.79. So we still have a long way to go. So that's why we're very keen to see what is happening around the world so that you can learn from best experience. What do you see as the role of the International Energy Forum? Yeah. So uh, I think this is the uh, very important uh, for the uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, cooperation between the uh, government and also the business. And uh, for the uh, International Energy Forum, we have a uh, joint the, uh, uh, data for the initiatives of the oil and gas. 
And this covers uh, the uh, 114 countries for the oil. And uh, for the gas, it's 85 countries. So by this, the uh, Judy the Theater, and we have the other seven partners. So by this one, is the improve the, uh, the transparency and the cooperation of these countries. By this one, uh, the government and the business have a better understanding of the situation. So by this, uh, the, uh, the, the, the cooperation and the uh, resonance of this uh, the improved. So uh, I feel that uh, this, uh, the data is uh, including South Africa is our uh, member country. So by this, I, I feel that in the future, uh, we can have more use of the data. And uh, last year, we had a workshop for the Judy data in Tunisia. And the, uh, in, uh, South, uh, in the Africa, we have uh, 30 countries join this the, uh, the workshop. And also, uh, we have uh, the uh, workshop in China and in Russia. So by this one, I feel that in the future, more and more countries can use this data and then improve the understanding and the transparency of the market and improve the security. What kind of a role could blockchain play in terms of security? Well, the inherent nature of blockchain is, is much higher security. So the, the entry of data still remains vulnerable um, because it's, it's, it's still prone to, to, to any um, manipulation. But besides that, once you have a database, it is the most resili resilient uh, data center, distributed data center database, if you wish. And it enables you to have much better control of your information. You know, what are you sharing? Who are you sharing it with? And, you know, for what purpose? Uh, now, in terms of World Economic Forum and how it can evolve is, is really trying, you're already in touch with the Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution. What is important is to agree on the common standard, just like whenever there is a you know, new technology. Naturally, we're also working with IEEE and mm -hmm. the traditional standard uh, makers. Um, but there is also the issue of sharing best practices. Right. Um, the regulatory part, so not all touches upon regulation, but some of the blockchain disruption will, the most interesting one, the peer-to-peer -peer trading. Uh, there are countries that have already started regulatory sandboxes. Uh, the leading happen to be in Europe, so it's, it's UK, Sweden, Austria. Uh, there is also a country that is uh, in Latin America, Chile, that already has a blockchain-based application to track uh, its incentive program. So um, those best practices need to be shared. Um, and uh, so within the EWF, we already have a global sharing of, of a common platform. So what we're building is one platform for everyone to use, because unlike a traditional IT application in blockchain, the core platform is an integral part of your application. So the more we do, the more blocks of that app that we build together, we call them frameworks, uh, the faster we will get to the commercial application of blockchain. So Carla, what do you, what do you see as the challenges of trying to um, create standards around cybersecurity. I mean, there is more discussion now about keep, um, holding private companies to, to particular standards, and maybe, um, you know, they may be open to some sort of liability if something happens to customer data or, you know, systems go down. So, what do you think the standard? could or should be for um, in this particular sector? And from your perspective, what would be the challenges in, in, in doing that? Uh, I think, I mean, uh, you know, standards are always a problem, but, uh, uh, you know, it depends which issue we are facing. The cyber security as the climate change impact is so big on the system, on each and every element of the system, the standard is an important, uh, an important word. And only, I mean, the, the, the trigger that we're looking at is the cooperation between the public and private sector because, you know, cyber attack is not anymore like 20 years ago, a little techie challenging your network or challenging your police system, but we're talking about much bigger, you know, uh, risks. So when the risk is so big as for climate change, public and private should come together. And that's what we see, you know, even if it doesn't go on the front pages uh, or newspaper or it's uh, uh, well known to the general public, but it's uh, in the countries in which we see operation, for example, for electricity, we see a very tight cooperation between uh, government official, police, you know, institution, public institution and the companies. So I, I think the standard is already, uh, you know, clear that because we know which problem we need to fix. That is uh, 
potential massive cyber attacks and systematic cyber attacks. So I think it's not a matter of standard, but to push forward uh, you know, the cooperation between public and private sector. And, uh, but I must say that from what my, my point of view, it's already there. Because I mean, uh, when the problem gets very serious, or potentially very serious, people are out there are acting. Uh, I mean, the company that is uh, financing our research interacts with more than 90 million customers uh, each day in 32 countries. So you can imagine the responsibility that, <coughs> sorry, that we bear in dealing with these people. And on the other side, there are governments that are fully aware of the risk and uh, actively working on this side. Okay. What are we not hearing? Um, you know, what is going on in the background? Is it worse than than you know the press <laughs> reports? <laughs> or uh, how many of you know how many of these uh, attack attempts are, are really you know going on every day? Is that I don't have an overview to be honest. Uh, what do we know is of course uh, we are being working with uh, ABB used to provide the network control system for many, for the decades decades. Uh, at that time, at least, uh, the, cyber sec the security was already a an, an topic, but there was a much less uh, scale. Because as I said before, the utility was very much, I, I should not say isolated, it's a well-defined problem in, this, in the technology terminology. It's really your scheduling, planning, controllable, and predictable. Even at that time, it's of course the security. The system is relatively isolated, but it's still, you, you could, uh, things could happen. But there was, nowadays, you, you, that model, technical model, it cannot be valid because of change of business model, because integration renewables, and we talk about this, uh, also e-mobilities, all this uh, connectivity between the countries, mm -hmm. and also new IT systems comes in. So what do we really need to, to do, I think there need a lot of new investment. And uh, that's why we, in the working group, we talk about what is the responsibility of the board of directors, create awareness. I think this needs to come from there. So we need to push for that. And we need to also, should not, of course, there are new technologies coming in, like a blockchain, et cetera. It's a part of the solution. But we should not also underestimate that we require a lot of skilled new people to come to the industry. And uh, this is a, a lot of things we need to be done. Uh, and I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a still a long way to go. Still a long way to go, in my opinion. Is it too much to ask of traditional providers in the industry to you know, step up with all of this investment in security at a time when they're also under attack from all kind of new competitors and trying to figure out new business models and the whole regulatory and political climate is not, not, not stable. Gonna... I would say that when, uh, when things get complicated, they either you lead or you disappear. So, I mean, uh, as uh, my colleague from IBB was saying, this is what you see in the utility space, people that are still uh, in the 20 years ago scheme and other companies that are actually trying to bring these things forward. So in other terms, 10 years ago, you could stay and sit down and say, oh, renewable is not gonna come. The company that have thought the renewable was not gonna come uh, probably are in bad shape, better shape today than uh, in the future. And there are other companies that embrace the renewables and actually push it forward. The, the, the investment uh, the honorable minister was mentioning, uh, if you see in South Africa, are made by companies that actually are leading the pack and finding new countries and new with which to cooperate on renewables. And this, uh, this is uh, the same for cybersecurity. You know, you can say, okay, let's not put smart meter because electromechanical meter are much safer. Clearly, you cannot uh, hack an electromechanical meter. But if you know, if you see the technology that uh, some of the leading companies have deployed in smart meter, it's as difficult to act to hack as a smart meter, as a digital meter. So it's again, or you stay. If you stay, stand still, it's not going to work, like in any other sector. But especially in the electricity sector nowadays, I mean, you can say coal is the best solution for South Africa, and uh, like uh, 20 years ago. If you're not hearing what, uh, what, uh, what the public wants, so more sustainable uh, power generation, more distributed generation, you, you will stand still and not doing nothing or leading the investment uh, you know, in the countries. And this applies, I think, to each and every piece, to electromobilities, uh, you know, and clearly the industry after, uh, let's say, 
a stable grow between uh, 1920 and 19, uh, uh, sorry, 2008, now it's facing competition. Now, most of the time I think we tend to, to look at a competition uh, with fear, but if we look at comp a competition with, uh, you know, with open openness, that's the key to look at. So sitting down with a startup company doing blockchain or with uh, another company doing vehicle to grid is the key. So being open uh, you know, to the innovation, you know, there was a time in which the only, uh, the only we were doing business at yeah. IBB and the big utility company and other you know, five, six provider worldwide. Now there are companies like uh, you know, NL that have a special track of procurement for innovative company, you know, even three, 10 people company, because you should be able to listen to ideas and put some skin in the game in trying uh, new stuff and see how, how do they works. And eventually, I mean, uh, as uh, she was saying, eventually take sh some shares or integrate the company that are doing best in, uh, in, in innovation. Do people in the audience agree with, um, with his take? Um, does anybody want to jump in with uh, an opinion on that or a question for any of our panelists? Do we have uh, people here uh, from, uh, from China who could talk a little bit about um, how they see the um, the mix uh, between um, public and private collaboration um, evolving in, uh, in China? Anybody wants to chime in? Maybe she's all here. Ah, yes, great. Can we? Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm from IHS Market in China. And uh, of course, uh, like uh, we're doing any parts of the, the world, we assist many companies in China in you know, working on energy as well. I think one of the things that's become very apparent in many actually Asian countries is that there's a large grid utility that's generally state owned. It's very hard to penetrate that part of the business. And oftentimes you actually don't, you, can't, you don't even want to try it. But what we're seeing emerging is that we, we now have this distributed part of the business especially solar, if we look at Chinese solar additions last year, 50 gigawatts of solar additions last year. This year may be lower, 30. But these are huge numbers, and, and more than half of that is on the distributed side. And that's attracted a lot of private investment into that space uh, to get really consumer side energy. But there's a question now of what does that mean for grid stability? Mm -hmm. and we've seen cost escalations in countries like Germany because of the distributed side and utilities face challenges. I don't think that conversation is quite happening yet, at least in the open, about how this growing part of the business of distributed energy system, solar, storage, et cetera, is working along the state side of the business. And I think that's something people are still trying to figure out. And it's a testament you know, when we look at the data that solar and wind curtailment levels are very high, 20, 30 percent. Um, and that's sort of a reflection of the fact that uh, the public and private sectors don't seem to be working very closely together yet. And uh, we still need to figure out exactly how to move that forward without compromising grid uh, reliability. And, and uh, please. Uh, just to give an opinion. Uh, uh, our experience in South Africa is that uh, if there's competition, as I said, we've got an, a national utility that is 100% owned by the state. But uh, when it comes to renewable, if you bring more private sector players, that competition dry, dry, drives down the prices for electricity. Even though the first two rounds in South Africa of renewable energy were very high, but after that, we see a, a downward trend of going down where the consumer benefits. So I think the solution lies in a real competition between the public and the private sector. Yeah. If, if I may, I mean, uh, I would uh, first make a comment since uh, the research center I work in uh, is uh, having a lot of interaction with Chinese uh, electricity sector, especially state-owned company. 
And uh, guess what? I think uh, there are lots of forward thinkers in the uh, Chinese electricity state-owned company, at least from uh, my own experience. Now, moving an entire system like China towards uh, the energy transition is not as fast as doing it in Portugal. But uh, I, trust me, there are officials out there that are thinking about the energy transition and have actually you know, made uh, these things, uh, the energy transition starting and happening in China. The second comment I would make that is uh, I would challenge the idea that uh, distributed generation brings uh, up the cost because uh, any statistics, so I'm talking about facts, on uh, countries where renewables have been deployed, uh, this, there was not an increase in network management cost uh, that were bared by, by customers. I'm talking about UK, Spain, Italy, whatever statistics you take. And as the Honorable Minister was correctly saying, the price has proven to be going down and down to the point that countries that used to have an energy mix uh, more fossil fuel dedicated are moving strongly uh, uh, like South Africa towards a renewable mix. So again, uh, I think uh, I mean the key factor when talking about electricity is having in mind a little sentence, a Latin sentence, nunc et odie. You should look uh, when you're taking decision, you are talking about the electricity system, uh, what is happening now and today in, uh, in uh, you know, not take the average, take the excellence and see how the system can go. It's uh, likely, I mean, if you take the average or the worst case, you know, it's the worst case. If you take the excellence, you know that things can happen. And I'm talking about curtailment uh, that have been reduced thanks to technology. I'm talking about uh, distributed generation that is well managed and, uh, and so other stuff. But prices are going down and there is no impact uh, other than positive impact uh, uh, from renewable coming in the energy mix for final consumer being, uh, you know, household or industrial consumer. Well, so then my question is, if this is the case, if it's, you know, there's obvious benefits to consumers, there's no additional cost on, on the network, why is it taking so long to, you know, meet the, the goals set by the, the, the Paris Agreement? What, what is preventing us from moving forward Let faster? Yeah, thank you. Let's decouple the Paris Agreement from the electricity generation because, as you know, it's not about uh, producing electricity that we can save our planet. It's a good share, but it's not only about producing electricity. I would invite all of you to see the increase in renewables that uh, in the last 25 years. You cannot talking about slowing down. You can talking about accelerating, like being an electric car. Uh, and uh, stuck in the engines, uh, meaning uh, even if uh, our colleagues correctly pointed out that Chinese, for example, slow down PV this time, if you plot in a 20, 25 year scheme, you see a tremendous acceleration in the, in the last uh, six to seven years. So I can say the, the energy industry, the electricity industry has made its contributions, and uh, thanks again to, to you know, uh, cooperation between public and private sector, this is actually happening. You have a global perspective, so yes. what? And I think these are the uh, environment, the private, I think uh, the, uh, especially in China, I think very fast. And uh, worldwide we can see that the, the environment in the energy from the uh, transportation, RNG, and also for the contribution of GDP, and especially is uh, for the employment. And then China is a very good uh, the, uh, example. <laughs> that employment of this, the manpower, more people is from the private sector, more than the, uh, the uh, public. And also, you ask a question, why cannot we be more faster? Yeah, I think very good question. And then I think several reasons. And uh, for example, in China, because of the energy industry is the, uh, the, uh, the very large in industry, and they have a high standards. This is one of the issues. And also for the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the involvement of the business, for the small business, and it's not easy to get involved in, uh, into this with the high investment, security reasons. And another reason is from the government part, and they uh, also have higher regulations and they uh, also higher uh, the, uh, security requirements. If any explosion, another happens, and a big issue. So I think both sides. And however, in the long view, we can see that. For the sonar PV, for the uh, for the wing, for the hydro, 
And for this part in China, and the, I think developed very fast. And however, now the issue is the subsidy issues. And originally, government gave a lot of subsidy cities. From this year, government reduced the subsidies. So that's the reason. And this year, a little bit lower than the year before. Yeah. But however, for long view, I think developed very fast already. Yeah. Anna, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I just wanted to share my experience that mm. most of the innovators that I have met come from economies that have unbundled energy markets. And it's not a co coincidence. Um, and now we're also seeing others start in other areas where they see uh, an interesting use case. Uh, one is energy access. I see a, a colleague here, um, uh, like Bangladesh and other countries that are looking at this, this area. Um, uh, so it's a matter also of awareness uh, raising. And uh, like uh, my colleague Papa said, uh, you know, it's also who is going to lead, who is going to follow, like in any um, new area. Uh, many are in wait and see mode. Uh, others are saying, no, I want to start and test. Others start learning about it and then start testing. Um, so I think that there's various stages uh, of development. Uh, but we have to remember that the, the innovation is global. So even if you are very well protected, you have your high margins because you're not unbundled, it's going to come to you. Because people are going to get their electric car, they're going to get their little solar panel, and you know, they will not need you as much, or they will need you to support them in a different way. Um, so it, it is coming, it's just that it's happening faster in, in markets that have unbundled. Just one point uh, that we need to take into consideration as well is the issue of the regulator that I think we need a very resilient, independent regulator that must pro protect the consumer, not the state company. It must work on behalf of the people. Because I find sometimes that uh, regulators, uh, sometimes they become fixated in protecting a state company as if that is the best thing to do, when in fact the direct opposite is the correct one, that there are primary consideration. What is the benefit to the people, namely those who consume electricity? If we have those independent regulators, I think we'll be moving very well in protecting the people. Yeah. And, and I think, I mean, uh, I, I, I love the idea of uh, bundling and unbundling as roadblocks for innovation. But uh, I mean, the idea of having uh, our business is very regulated. You know, even if you cannot think about electric cars, but to put, uh, you know, a, a charger, it's a regulated system. So it's key. And if you look at the history of electric electricity industry, for example, in Italy, by the time the government decides to unbundle the sector, so to push for innovation, they set the an heavy, uh, you know, heavy weight regulators with an innovative view and an eye on consumer, because that's key. You know, it's it's a really uh, of tremendous importance, uh, and the regulators worldwide that have been on the forefront of the energy transition have been uh, the right couple. You know, with utility company colleagues, appears uh, fighting uh, most of the time, but fighting for the good of the electricity system. So I would, uh, I would stress the idea that regulators uh, should be and must be innovative and should be open uh, you know, to, to any solution to the point that they are good for customers, uh, whatever they are, household or industrial user. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Because uh, one thing we should uh, acknowledge is the role of technology in this past decade. You know? I agree with you. You say, we, why one, can't we go even faster? Sure, we want to go faster, but actually the world has achieved a lot in the past decades. If you look at the, the scale of the renewables we have today, and uh, partially because of technology advance, the power electronics, software, etc. of course. And uh, in the morning I joined another session, we talk about make it even more sustainable, we need to look at the, like energy storage, the whole system. I heard that the cost of battery has been new, technologies have been half, and then the second generation even further half. So a lot, a lot of new things are coming. So this is really exciting. And then, of course, in the, in the past few past hours, we talk a lot about challenge, about the security risk, etc. From supply point of view, like you are our customers, we see this also as an opportunity, 
Because when we do business with our customer, what is the base foundation? The foundation is the trust, right? Because they share a lot of data with us, their financial data, their business data, et cetera, personal data. So of course, now we see the risk as, as a security risk, but if we can turn it around, make it more secure, this can be a competitive edge for us. That's why I, I agree there's a lot of new companies will come into the space, but also for us, we see this is a great opportunity also. You know. So because, uh, well, uh, one of the opportunities for the traditional players is to um, figure out interesting services to build around the yeah. data that they collect. But there, the regulators have to weigh in too so that it's clear what can and cannot be done with, uh, with the data. Um, so um, what are some of the other opportunities that you see for traditional players in terms of new services that could be launched? And what does everybody think that the traditional players should be doing now and, you know, in order to that maybe they haven't started doing yet, um, in order to prepare for this very different future. I mean, we, we look at the, what we need to, one thing we have to acknowledge is for the utility space, it's completely different, right? As we talk about these complete dynamics, the, the balancing of supply and demand, this is really completely different. And the new technology, obvious technology, I used to say in the past, it's, the space is very much like automation. In the past, it's, uh, it's you know, the, the greed, the utility, I won't call them a control, it's more the supervision. You go from supervision, planning, go to the automation, so real time, and planning, etc. So, so those, those are the technologies, it, it's coming. And for us, as a, as a, as a leading uh, power technology provider in, in, in the world, of course, we continue to work with our own to develop new technology, but we also look for technology partnership the startup, we continue to look for the new technologies, and in particular look at the technology from other domains. I mentioned from the automations and from the sensing, and we talk about the framework like a fourth industrial revolution, all these smart something. It's basically you talk about you introduce more sensing technology with software, with the control, so you improve the flexibility and reliability of the assistant. So we, we see a lot of opportunity, but the partnership with our technology provider is one of the key. Would you like to weigh in on what people yes. should be doing to prepare? Yes, and the, uh, for the uh, climate change now, it's become a very important subject. And also for the energy industries uh, for the future, and I think it's at uh, the time, and the, uh, because we are international organization, and sometimes some of the, uh, uh, the traditional uh, the energy players and assets, and the, uh, how do you see this? And how about the future investment? and how to improve this environment, uh, the, uh, the uh, resilience and the uh, sec security. So I think uh, the, uh, another important issue is to have a right outlook for the future, for the studies of this and how the energy transition will develop and have a better understanding of this. I think this is a very important issue. And the, uh, however, some of <coughs> uh, the uh, discussions. And the, uh, every year, uh, February uh, IEF, we have an uh, international energy outlook and the, uh, the uh, invited the IEA, invited the OPEC, and also GECF, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, some of the <coughs> industries, uh, the companies like BP, Shell, and others also involved. So we have these discussions. And then to see the future, for example, by 2040, uh, what is the mixture of the oil and gas, or coal, and also for the uh, sauna PV, for the wind, and others. So by uh, this is the studies, I think in the future, we'll give a uh, support and for the future investment and also the energy investment uh, resonance. Okay. Um, anybody else want to weigh in on that? I, I, I can just add from our perspective, we see both innovation in transactionary and in transformative businesses. So anything from back office and billing, uh, asset management uh, to different business models. And what can one do? One can learn, for sure. As far as regulators are concerned, uh, my colleagues are exactly right. Sometimes they adopt something and they're already too late. Um, so I also expect a lot of innovation on the vendor side, especially in opening up protocols, something that they do not like. Uh, but we need the SCADA system and the smart meter and all the connectors to be open so that when you have a new product that is software, you are not limited by hardware 
and you don't have to send a box, but you can actually connect, just like you connect your phone to the world, you can connect your smart meter or SCADA system to apps that are global. Uh, this will really open up innovation. When it comes to blockchain, are they moving, are people moving, the traditional players moving fast enough? Um, some are, many are learning. Uh, when they learn more, they start hiring IT people in their company or working with a startup because the, the, the talent is still very limited in this space. Minister, you want to? From our side, uh, even though we cannot always predict the future, but I think the general trend is towards renewables. Uh, even though, as I said, we are a very cold country, but we can see the trends around the world and we are already affected ourselves. So we've begun to speak as ministers of energy in SADC, the Southern African Development Community, to look at gas because there are a lot of reserves of gas in Africa, especially in Tanzania, Mozambique, and Namibia, to look how we can be able to increase the, the mix of gas projecting towards the future. So as a result, we are busy uh, developing what we call a gas master plan for SADC in order to ensure that uh, that element is not forgotten. Anybody in the audience want to give a perspective from their country? Uh, being from the United States and particularly from California, we, uh, we had probably the most famous deregulation ever to fail in the world. Um, yeah, I mean, in South Africa, they were laughing at us, just to, just to let you know. We, le we learn from the best. <laughs> <laughs> because we, we, we did a deregulation of, of electric grid based on the assumption that all those institutions that had worked so well in a regulated environment would somehow operate in a deregulated environment. And so, uh, you know, now, we, now that we know that the laws of supply and demand still work and opportunistic suppliers in a, in a limited uh, environment with excess demand will take advantage of it uh, to their own benefit. I, I'll ask a question because ever since the 2003 disaster in, uh, in California, other states have tried to tweak, to use a U.S. term, that model to make the old model still work. And Virginia and others are making it work, but they're still relying on, as our gentleman from South Africa said, you know, we have to have great regulation. Government needs to get out of the way, but government still needs to regulate. Well, let me, let me ask a question for this panel that I'm interested in. If we look at the history of taxi cabs in the United States, highly regulated, supply uh, in New York City was famously, you know, you had to have a medallion uh, in order to, to do it, and the system actually worked until Uber came along. Why in the world are we still trying to avoid an Uber of energy? The, the, the reality is that in this, leaving cyber security out for just a moment, because we need it to work regardless, but why is it that an infinite amount of calculations of opportunistic demand shedding and opportunistic su uh, supply providing without the distortions of subsidies and who gets how much and who gets this guarantee and that guarantee being dominant. I mean, obviously you don't want to shed nuclear power that's online. There are some places, there are some, but if they want to be a must be sold, then they're going to have to be discounted in some way. But if you look at that as, if you will, nuclear power is the, the old taxi cab company that still has some base business, why wouldn't we Uber the electric grid, taking the regulator completely out of it and putting active intelligence in and then overseeing only for illegal gaming of the system. Why wouldn't that cause the willing buyer and willing seller to work in a way, you know, you mentioned a Tesla person or somebody driving an electric car. Why is it the person driving down the road, I can guarantee you Elon Musk can make a Tesla that will know that the price of electricity is varying and decide when to pull over to get electricity because the price is right at that moment because solar is at a peak and they've got nowhere to send it. So my question goes right down to the simplicity. Why not look at Ubering, if you will, Ubering, Lyft, and so on, the electric grid 
so that in fact we actually create a willing buyer, willing seller and modernize the system. Who wants to take that? <laughs> I'm second after you. Okay, okay. I can say so. No, I, I use Uber from time to time. Sometimes <laughs> it comes a few minutes later. It's okay, not a big deal. <laughs> Uh, but we tend to forget that we are so much dependent on electricity. We are so much dependent. And uh, since it's so reliable, we even forget, you know, it's a given. So I think the requirement is very high for, to get the reliable electricity supply. That is, I think, one of the reasons probably is there are certain things you need to still need the regulations and you need at least the proven technologies to make this work. That was my point. Anna, what do you think? Yeah, I suggest you check out startups like Share and Charge and some others. They're already doing this, um, so it's already happening. Uh, but we will, I think, still need a regulator for some time exactly to avoid the problems that California had. We actually have a problem with our regulation. <laughs> and I know that in the U.S. you have so many jurisdictions and so many different programs, and one of the problems with climate change, um, fighting climate change, is exactly that these programs have national boundaries and should not. So, so that will also come. Um, but I think for a while, the grid management should be regulated and then, and then go forward from there. And we will still need the grid for some time. Uh, another um, app that we're working on, more like a framework, is a simulation environment, uh, where you simulate the, the spot balancing, market balancing, and and uh, this, um, probably sometime next year, can be used by energy companies to see if they want to invest in a new asset, how that will work and how the market will change. But in the future, it will actually uh, avoid at least local market uh, uh, settlements and balancing and be recursive. So in the future, this may be real, uh, but I think until it's fully tested, uh, we should keep um, some regulation in place. What do you think? Hey, I met uh, the founder of uh, Uber in Davos January this year. He says he's very afraid of taxi drivers in South Africa. <laughs> 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 so, taking that example, we cannot Uberize the energy sector in South Africa very fast. It has to come in stages. That's why I said we started uh, with uh, introducing competition to the generation part. The next phase is to deal with the grid. Our view tentatively is that uh, we need some kind of a, like an independent systems market operator so that there is a non-discriminatory access into the national grid in order to deal the balance between those who are independent power producers and the state utility. So that's the trend that we seem to be uh, moving towards rather than the one night stand of uh, California. Boom, done. So we believe in a gradual managed transformation of uh, the electricity sector in Colin, South Africa. What do you think? Okay. Uh, I was around uh, in California working there in 2003 when the things happened. Uh, I think with, uh, with uh, just a sentence, uh, you cannot pretend to uh, cancel regulators if they do make a mistake. You can push for them uh, to be more innovative and maybe paying the same salary that you pay at Tesla to get the smart people working there. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is about uh, Uberize, the electricity sector, very fascinating. If you are familiar and you are with the Uber business model, it's not actually working exactly you know, in the best way for the interest of everyone, uh, especially for the drivers, to the point that there are uh, you know, new companies uh, or new platforms in Europe like MyTaxi that are taking over because they are licensee drivers and they actually work. You have the same uh, funny things and interesting, you know, fast service of Uber, but it's, uh, it's regulated in the interest of the, of the workers. And uh, so, I mean, uh, maybe, uh, you know, on the generation side, you can think about, uh, you know, Uberize, but then you still need to know, it, as you know, that, I mean, uh, the, the Tesla, not the guy of, uh, the new guy, but the old guy, was thinking about flying electrons in the air. The electrons are still coming to you through wires, and the wires is uh, one. It's difficult to imagine that the wires can be more than one. So there will always be a piece uh, of the electricity sector until electrons fly. 
Yeah, 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 exactly. And, uh, and you know that uh, while a taxi driver is in some shape or form supporting the infrastructure so that actually the road is uh, in good shape, the Uber driver is not. So it's a matter of uh, you can skin the cat to a certain level, if you, if you know what I mean. And then uh, going to your interesting point about charging uh, you know, the electric cars uh, when the, the electricity is free or when it's uh, you know, more green mix, uh, uh, in, uh, in our own constituency, there is a company that, by the way, is California-based uh, called MotorWorks uh, that is actually you allowing you to do so, charging today. So you can charge when the mix is more towards renewables, and you can charge when it's cheaper. And uh, if you go to Scotland and you take uh, IRA Tesla, you can actually charge it for free because the regulators has decided where there is excess capacity is going to be provided to the citizen for free. Thank you. So I'm, um, we're, we're going to have to wrap up uh, the panel. Thank you so much for that question. Um, and I think uh, what we can safely take away from today is that uh, the sector uh, is, has been changing quickly, maybe not as fast as some people would like, uh, but it's making progress that um, for at least the short term, we're still going to need a certain amount of regulation. A number of, of uh, pilots and tests are going on with blockchain uh, and other new technologies that promise to um, open up the sector to a lot of new business models and a lot of exciting things. But we're probably get, we're going to need some regulation to get us there, and we're going to need some some proper oversight um, to make sure. Uh, that things uh, evolve uh, properly um, and that uh, international organizations, including the Energy uh, Forum and uh, the uh, World Economic Forum's new res uh, Resiliency uh, uh, Forum, will be trying to tackle some of the big issues around cybersecurity going forward. Thank you all for participating this morning. And big thank you, a round of applause, please, for our panelists. Okay. for <laughs>